said, although now I really feel like a giant up here. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be at Belleville Church and to have been invited to come and just share the message. Um, the emphasis, of course, is ended now. And I personally love emphasis days um, in whichever form they represent because they help us to come together globally to focus on something that is important that the church needs to recognize and work towards in making better. And for this time, it's on End It Now. And it's not only something for women, it's something that affects us as a community. It's something that now we're going to share. I, I find it so beautiful from the messaging of the lessons that we've been having and um, the songs. Everything speaks of Christ's love for those that are in need. It speaks of our part as well, of what we need to do so that we can make a difference within the church. Because we cannot just listen to the word and not do anything about it. We need to share it. We need to share it amongst ourselves. And um, maybe something we can do is maybe look around and see, is there someone who's not in church today, who you haven't seen for a while, who you have not checked on? You know someone, isn't it? I think all of us can remember someone. I haven't seen uh, Sister Mary for a while. I haven't seen this brother for a while. But have we taken that step? And that's why the message for today is, go, go find my sheep. Now, when we speak of um, going to find the sheep, you do know that we can be lost outside and within, isn't it? So there's the one sheep that is lost that we definitely need to find because it's a must. And then there's the 99 that we're here and we're somewhat lost in our little steps for each day. And all of us need that care. A little bit on the end it now emphasis. I want to just bring the reality of what abuse looks like within South Africa. So within one in five women in relationships, so one, two, three, four, five, as we're sitting in our pews, there is someone that is suffering from abuse. And within one in three general kind of abuse, it can be someone from work, it can be someone a stranger, in general, that is one in three women. And then when we move it to the men as well, because these things do happen to everyone, and we're not even touching on the children. In men, it's one in six. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six. So someone, and actually many people in the congregation have been exposed, have experienced this. So when we speak about the lost sheep and when we look at ourselves, it's not something that is happening on the outside. It's not a their problem, it's not a worldly problem. It's our problem combined. The parable of the lost sheep is in Matthew 18, verse 10 to 14, and it's also in Luke. And then it speaks about the action, right? Where there was a lost sheep and then Jesus went, and then the, the shepherd went to find the lost sheep. It also looks at the celebration that accompanies the return of the lost sheep. Then Jesus told them in this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred and loses a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and goes after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, come and rejoice with me. Jesus makes an important statement in Luke as well, that God's desire is to keep his sheep from being lost. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And that is found in Matthew. Why was the lost sheep, why was the sheep lost? Have you thought of that? Was it left behind? Did it leave on its own? Did something happen? Research shows that a lot of things that happen within the church, the experiences that we have, 
When we do not feel seen or heard or supported, people leave the church. They go maybe find another church. Some leave completely and decide to do it online. It's easier, you get to get the message, but you miss out on the fellowship. Now, what do we do? I believe it's time that we continuously use Christ's method. Maybe we try mingling with one another. Sister White says there is true success in Christ's method. Mingling with people means that we know what is happening in each other's lives. We get to, to hear the things that are happening and follow up on each other. You must come close to those of whom you labor, that they may not only hear your voice, but shake your hand, learn your principles, and feel your sympathy. Is this how we're connected with one another? The church is a space of refuge and a space where we need to experience the goodness of each other, the goodness of growth, the learnings, all the things good. But sometimes we do not have a good shepherd. Sometimes we, we wander off, we get lost, and we do not have anyone to come back and bring us to the fold. When an injury happens in a place where care should be administered, it is confusing to the survivor. And when I speak of a survivor, I just want to share that from my experience with working with rape crisis, working with women, refugees, working with young girls in the communities, the legal term, of course, is, is victim. But it does not speak to the hope. It doesn't speak to the healing. So as I'm going to be sharing today, I will reference to victims as survivors because there is hope that they can be celebrated, that they can be brought back to the fold, that they too can become part of the community without the stigma of being looked at as that one who experienced that thing. It can be the woman sharing about her experiences on domestic violence. Can we hear that conversation in church? Are we able to hear it and understand it? Or do we immediately judge? It can be the family reeling from a sexual incident that happened. It can be a young person who's being groomed by someone that they respect, someone that we all know in the neighborhood, in the church. It can also be another survivor that has gone through other things within their lives. The Lord points to the reasons why the sheep were scattered in his reproach to the irresponsible shepherds of Israel. And this is in Ezekiel 34, verse 3 to 4. You do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. There is a lot of rebuke in this message. And there is many examples of the things that we can do to help others. You do not need to look far. You do not feed the flock. You have not strengthened those that are weak. Have you seen someone in need of the word? Someone who needs support? Have we approached them? You have not healed those who are sick. Have we gone to those that have been sick and away from church? Maybe they too need that visit. They are away from church so long that it's easier to be at home and be sick because no one has checked in as much. Yes, we pray for them. Let us pray for the sick. Let us pray for those that are in trouble. But if we can name them, we can visit them. We can show them that they too are important and they are missing within the congregation. The shepherd is looking for people to go in search of the lost. He is also looking for people who will strengthen the weak, bind up the broken, and help the wounded. Are you that person? God goes out to give his mercy to those that are in need of it most. Those that have been labeled, those that have been disgraced. Are you in need of God's mercy? God's plan for our growth includes other people. We cannot grow on our own. What good is that? 
I think this morning, um, the leader who was sharing the adult uh, lesson was speaking of the two commandments. Love God, and the next one is love your neighbor, isn't it? Your neighbor, while we're here, we need to embrace the space of the neighbor, the community. That way when we come and arrive in front of God, we can say we have done our part to bring people to Christ. Sometimes it's the silence of not knowing what to do. So amongst ourselves, we don't know what to do when someone is in trouble. But what that prepares uh, but what that shows to the person or portrays to the person in trouble is that we do not care. Let us find a way to say, I am here to listen. You don't need to know too many details. When you're ready, we can talk. May I pray with you? Easy steps for whatever is happening in people's lives. Others have been struggling in abusive relationships, but because they know how the church will react, they will not show it. They will go on, dress splendidly for Sabbath, look amazing, hold their husbands in their arms or hold their wives in their arms and look picture perfect. So you do not know what's happening behind closed doors. You do not know what happened to get them here this morning because this is what we're portraying the church to be and yet it is a hospital for the sick. I am an abuse prevention officer at church, at Claremont Church. And uh, like the elder also mentioned before, um, I also work a lot in mental health. And I work very closely with women and men. Within the church, I work with couples. And the things that are shared in those spaces and just the bravery of couples coming to speak it takes a lot. It takes prayer. It takes uh, breaking the thoughts of saying, uh, if you can't pray it away, then there's something wrong. Sometimes these are the tools that are put in place to support within the church, to help and to bring out the things that need to come out of the darkness and into the light so that we may be a healthy church. There's a story of Jane that is told. And um, Jane was married to an elder. And then they were also suffering, uh, she was suffering from physical abuse. She was suffering from all these kinds of abuse. And then when she finally left the relationship, she was frowned upon. Because sometimes you don't even know what's happening in people's relationships. You just know that they are no longer together. And then definitely someone should have done something wrong. And sometimes, actually always, it's the woman's fault. And as the gossip and things continue, the positions in church, there's no more respect. She was a Sabbath school superintendent. She was kindly asked to step down because it didn't look right for her to serve in that capacity. And that's not meaning this happens in all churches. No. Some churches, they understand. Some churches allow and they move. But others, those few others, that's why this message keeps coming each and every year, for us to be able to make a difference in these spaces. These experiences of many survivors of domestic abuse across cultures and the whispered conversations and the frosty distance of once loving people, unbearable. They think that if they, some would say that maybe if the person had prayed more, then this wouldn't have happened. Or maybe they should have stuck it out a little bit longer, then eventually there was going to be an answer. Now, stopping abuse definitely needs prayer. We need prayer. But it also needs a change within the heart of the abuser. And that is something they too need to be willing. Because remember, there's free will. And people need to also be willing to make those changes. Again, with Christ's method, minister to people's needs. So when you see someone's needs, they can be different. It can be food, it can be counseling, 
It can be caring for the elderly. It can be the children. Do your part. Let us turn our Bibles to Isaiah 61, verse 1. I just want to read a little bit on this sermon in the synagogue of yeah, Nazareth. And this was the messianic prophecy. I just want to read the first three verses. The good news of salvation. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Amen. How the Lord responds to the lost and the hurting is also mentioned in Psalms. He heals the brokenhearted. It is clear that healing of the broken hearts and providing comfort to the wounded is crucial in our work for the Lord. We need to be able to respond in a way that is true to our hearts and true to God's word. When we speak of abuse as well, let us remember the children. They are a part of this and a big part of it. All the things that happen, they always filter to our young ones. And what we sometimes don't realize is that as these things happen quietly in our homes, they are sipped in by our children. They notice them. And so I'm glad for the afternoon program that I've seen as well, because in the next generation, they say up to 65% of our young ones will be plagued with anxiety, with depression, because of everything that they've been witnessing and we feel and think that they're okay. But they take on what we do. We walk as if everything is fine. We don't do anything about it, but we don't realize that we are passing them, that on to them as well. This can have many, many outcomes that are dangerous because it speaks to the mind, it speaks to the body, and in the body it shows up with backaches, it shows up with headaches, it shows up with many different symptoms that are saying, I'm not okay, I need help, I need someone to see me. The shepherd left 99 others to search high and low for the lost sheep. Jesus stresses that when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he rejoices over it. But first, he puts the sheep on his shoulder and carries it home. Is that what we do? Can we go out and find someone who has been lost? And then we celebrate when they come back to church. And then upon that celebration, just, just encouraging them. So the, the shoulder is the encouragement for them to come back, the positive words for them to come, the acknowledgement that they have been missed, all those things that come before they actually enter the doors again. Because that little gap is very important from the part where they are still where they are at, where they are lost, to making the steps all the way to church, to dressing up to saying, I haven't seen these people in months, to dressing up to say, others are going to be whispering, but they are those I know who have missed me. Let us win people's confidence, also Christ's method. How do we show that we care? We listen without judgment. We choose not to judge 
anyone, especially when they share the ordeals that they have encountered. We provide warmth, comfort, and support that promotes healing. We speak out about the dangers of abuse. We hold the people that have done wrong accountable. Lovingly, but they need to be held accountable. We work to make the church a safe community. Because there are people that you might know in the church who give inappropriate hugs. There are people you know in the church who don't have the best jokes. There are things that make our young ones cringe, but we haven't paused to say, brother, side hugs or a handshake. Let us, let us make it comfortable for our young ones because for us it's okay for an embrace and you can speak up. For the young ones, it's a little bit more difficult. And if it's the norm and the culture of the church, then they have to be in those hugs. But I can personally say I'm not keen on hugs. And I can speak up for myself and I give side hugs. Where I'm comfortable, yes, I can give someone a full embrace. But are we protecting the generations? Are we also checking ourselves to say, these are the things that we're doing? Because they're natural. We've been doing it, you know? Abuse is not a subject on which uh, the church can be silent. We need to make our steps, however small they might be. And before we even get to the rate, I think what I want to emphasize the most is that before we even get to the step of abuse, there are subtle things that happen beforehand. There are many small things that we can identify be before it becomes something bigger. And this is where we need to come in and make those changes. The shepherd of the parable is a great example in that he took one simple step. He went in search of the lost sheep. Sometimes going in search of survivors means that you're sitting with them and hearing their stories. And sometimes it's not even anything related to the issue. They can be telling about the weather. They can be talking about their grandchildren. They can be talking about school. But you're there to listen. You're listening without a filter. You're making them comfortable. You're hearing a story as it is and not how you would like it to sound. You're bringing them to church events. You're sitting together at church to show support. Being there with them and for them. There is no survivor who wants to be separated. There is no one who wants to be at home watching online unless there is something relationally that is happening at church. So let us seek out those that are not here with us. They want their stories to be heard and taken seriously and not ignored or pushed under the rag. They want to know that the church cares about them, not just the 99 others who also have a few issues here and there, but they are also shielding them perfectly. They want policies that will act for their safety and protection. Often we hear stories of people feeling lost and alone in the middle of church and in the congregation because we learn to hide it much better than others. Some of our stories are not exposed, but when it comes to abuse, that story sometimes is exposed in the end. What are the steps that we should take? If we're to find the lost, we need to know what to do with them when they return. So you've done all the stops or the steps before. They've come to the church, you've been praying, you've been supporting them. Now you're in church together. What are the next steps? What are the things that you need to do? Because this is something that, is, that keeps happening in the world. We need to continue to listen. We need to continue to show love. 
We need to show it without judgment. We need to bid them to follow Jesus. So in everything, always show them the cross so that they know that Christ will help them through it all. When we face the reality of the issue, we can put plans in place to find the lost. So this is something we can do as a church, something we can do as a family. With my family, we write names on, on a white sheet of the people we want to pray for, or the people that we haven't seen. And then every time we pass somewhere in the house, there's names on that cupboard so that we immediately remember to pray for those people. We pray for our beautiful oldies that we haven't seen. And you know, it, it keeps that reminder, but it has to be intentional for it to be successful. We need to cultivate an environment with zero tolerance to abuse. We need to say no to violence and we need to break that silence. So again, I will repeat about the shepherds in Ezekiel. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field. When they were scattered, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered. Are we a congregation that has scat st scattered flock? Or are we representing the good shepherd where we want to make a change and support one another? Jesus is calling us today to find his sheep. In closing, I would like to share from Patriarchs and Prophets. We are all woven together in the great web of humanity and whatever we can do to benefit and uplift others will reflect in the blessings on ourselves. So let us continue to help one another. Let us continue to see each other. Let us find those that are lost. Bring them to the fold for whatever reason it may be. Start with prayer. Amen.